everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School. Glad uh, y'all braved the weather. I really, coming out this morning and I saw the roads and they were a little icy and snowy, I told Melissa I didn't think anybody would be here, but here you are. So that's awesome. We can have Sabbath School this morning. So welcome. Those that are online, welcome also. Let's start with prayer and we'll jump right into the lesson. Father in heaven, thank you for Sabbath. Thank you for this time when we can come away from our busy schedules and our duties and responsibilities and just focus on you. And just now, Lord, we want to ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us as we study, open our hearts, our minds, guide us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this quarter we're going through the book of Hebrews, and we are now in Hebrews chapter 6 this morning. And what we're going to do, we're going to go a little further than the lesson, scope-wise. We're going to actually go through the whole chapter 6. The lesson kind of jumped around a little bit, but we're going to read through a little bit and, and go through Hebrews chapter 6. So let's begin and read verses 1 to 3. If someone would come up to the mic and read Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3. Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3. Thank you, Brent. Okay. Let us press on to repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we do if God permits. All right, so chapter 5, you know, there's, there's no real um, chapter splits in all Scripture. Those are kind of man-made after. And chapter 5 at the end was continuing on talking about getting off of the milk and getting on to the meat. And then in this, these first three verses of chapter 6, what are some of those elements of milk? Because that's really some of the things that are outlined here in these first three verses. Leaving, leaving behind the elementary principles, what are some of those, spelled out there in what we just read, what are some of those elementary principles of the gospel? Now, as you think about that and, and think about your answer, elementary doesn't mean we don't need them. right? Elementary doesn't mean uh, not necessary or not essential. So these are essential and necessary, but Paul is talking about them as elementary. In other words, the baby steps so that we can go on to the meat. So what are some of those elementary uh, doctrines, if you will, or things that Paul mentions? Go ahead. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out because just as we read them doesn't mean they're not needed. It just means we've already established those. That's right. I think is what that means. So it says not laying again a foundation of repentance. So we're saying, well, we got to repent first. That's right. They asked Peter, what do we need to do? He said, well, first thing you need to do is repent. So we're assuming we're repenting mm -hmm. from dead works, meaning I, I, I've, I've done this, I've done that. Well, that's wonderful, but that's not going to get you any place. That's right. And then it says instructions about washing, laying on hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. We're assuming all these things are taken as mm -hmm. the word of God. That's right. That there's going to be eternal judgment. That's right. And that we're going to need to obey God's word. So we've established that much. So that's the foundation. You know, the, the baptism is this idea of being born again. Right? When, you've, when baptism and repentance, uh, Romans chapter 6 all of Romans chapter 6 is talking about when you, when you die with Christ in baptism, you die with him so that you can be resurrected to a newness of life. That's being born again. So one of those foundational elements is to be born again. And then, like you said, the laying on of hands. Well, what does it mean to have the hands laid on you? Well, what did that mean? Well, what that meant was receiving the Holy Spirit. Can you be a Christian in this church and not receive the Holy Spirit. We'll go to Acts chapter 19 for a second. I don't know if you remember this story. Acts chapter 19 and verses 1 to 3. Notice this. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? 
when you believed. So they said to him, well, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) How do we receive what we never heard of? And then they go on, they say, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And they said to him, we were baptized into John, John the Baptist. We were baptized into John's baptism. So there is an element where you can be coming to church and doing the best you can and you haven't received the Holy Spirit. Think about how much better you'll be and feel when you receive the Holy Spirit. So that's interesting. So these are some foundational principles that we have to have in order to be moving on to the meat. And if those aren't in place, some of the things that that happen uh, in the Christian life won't make sense. By the way, another one, it says the resurrection of the dead. What does the resurrection of the dead show us? The fact that God can resurrect the dead. What does that tell you? That tells you something about his power. Right? All powerful. powerful. Even, Even power over death. That's a foundational understanding you have to have as a Christian. That it's not about your power, it's about his power. And he is all-powerful. Praise the Lord for that. And then uh, the eternal judgment is more than just that God is going to judge you, although that's part of it. It's also that God is going to protect you. Right? The act of judgment for the righteous is an act of protection. So you have to have these foundational things in place. Now let's go on. This is where it gets muddy. This is where we may struggle a little bit this morning as we read this. Maybe you struggled this week. Verses 4 to 6. If someone would come to the mic and read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. This is going to seem a little bit uh, troublesome, I think. Go ahead. Some of the more mature questions we need to ask ourselves are these. Can those who have left the faith, who were once happy in the Lord and who had received the Holy Spirit, be brought back to Christ? Can those who have tasted the goodness of God's word and felt the power of his coming kingdom be restored? Can fellow believers who have apostatized and abandoned their faith be brought to repentance and be brought back to the Lord? Let me answer these questions as one. It's impossible for such to be brought back to Christ if they continue to mock him by trying to make the Christian faith look ridiculous. By doing this, they're crucifying Christ all over again and holding him up to public contempt. Now that's a really good, what translation was that? Clear word. Oh, clear word, yeah. That was a really good translation. Go ahead, Dennis, you want to say something? I think the, fi- the finest example of somebody coming back to Christ was Peter. Hmm. He went out to Gethsemane and fell right where Jesus had prayed and with tears repented. Remember, he's the guy that denied Christ? Yeah. Just didn't say, oh, I don't believe him. Yeah. He swore that he didn't believe. I know not the man. And he cussed and, he cussed and swore. I know yeah. not the man. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit. That's where Peter was converted. Hmm. Right there in Gethsemane when he back. Yep. You know, every one of us, there's a song. Have you had a Gethsemane? Mm-hmm. I think we all need that. That's right. That's right. So this, some have, through the centuries, have struggled with this because, you know, it, my translation says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers to be restored. So, how do you wrestle with that? I mean, when you see somebody who was once a church member, maybe they were a head deacon, maybe they were a head elder, maybe they were a pastor, maybe they were a conference president, and now they're no longer in the church. Is it impossible to restore them? What do you think? Should we give up? Look at uh, Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews 10 and verse 26, kind of talking about the same idea. Somebody would read that for us. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. Because sometimes when you're giving Bible studies to somebody, they feel like they've gone too far. And some of them have read this verse, and they're like, well, I just feel like 
God can't love me. It's impossible for me to be saved. Go ahead, Juan. 10 verse 26. But if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the true, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Wow, so these are some pretty strong verses, right? I think, let, let, me, let me make comments. I, I like the translation that, yes. that she did because it says, if they continue, continue. to do so. So I believe if it's, they continue, it's impossible. Because so, there is no means of salvation. And what you're saying is in that condition, if they remain in that place where they mock God and they don't listen to God, it is impossible for them to be... Go ahead. If it's impossible for God to bring someone back, then my prayers are useless. Yes. There's not a family here that doesn't have a child missing. That's right. And if that's not the case, someday you may. Mm-hmm. I tell you, you, do all you can with that child. Send them to church school. Have family devotions with them. Mm. And yet they choose the way yeah. of the world. But you don't give up on them. That's right. And I don't think Christ gives up on them That's either. right. Now, there's some things in the verse that, you know, when we think about our children or even other people, and in in one of the reasons why we have to be careful, is, and, and it's why we went to Acts chapter 19. You know, the verse says, those who have fully tasted. Well, we don't know for sure that everybody that's stepped foot through those doors have fully tasted the Holy Spirit, have fully tasted salvation. They may have just had a form of godliness and they didn't realize it. So that's where, you know, that's where we have to make sure we're not playing the judge because we can't read the heart. We don't really know how deep of an experience that person has or has not had. We really don't. We can't judge that. So we've got to be careful when we make those kind of... Look at Psalm 66 and verse 18. Psalm 66 and verse 18. We're kind of painting a dark picture here first, but it will, the sun will come out at the end, I, I promise you. <laughs> so Psalm 66 and verse 18, if somebody would read that for us. Psalm 66... And verse 18. If I rega regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Hmm. If I, what does it mean to regard iniquity in my heart? Treasure it. Treasure it. I'm treasuring it. I'm planning for it. I'm excusing it. I'm making a space for it, right? And as long as I'm doing that, according to Scripture, the Lord will not hear my prayer. But there's one prayer he will hear, right? What's the prayer the Lord will hear? <laughs> help me. Lord, help me. I'm in a mess that I've made for myself. Deliver me from this mess. And the Lord will deliver us from that mess. Let's look at another one. This is an interesting verse. 1 John 5 and verse 16. 1 John 5 and verse 16. Anybody read that for us? 1 John 5 and verse 16. Thinking about sins and how that relates to how God hears us. 1 John 5 and verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say he should make a request for this. Woo! Two categories. You ever see that? Did you see the two categories? There is a sin that does not lead to death, and we should pray for those. But then there is a sin that does lead to death, and... According to John, we should not pray for those. How do you balance that? How do you make sense of that? What would a sin that doesn't lead to death, what might that be? We're going a little deep here this morning, I know. But what might that be, a sin that doesn't lead to death? Every sin that I've asked forgiveness of. Yeah, so, so what might a sin be that not... So let me give you an example. When we were first baptized and we just came into the church, did we know everything about Scripture? 
No. So guess what we did on Sabbath mornings? My mom would get us up, she would get us dressed, and she'd sit us down in front of the TV, and we'd watch cartoons Sabbath morning before church because we didn't know any better. Might that be a sin not unto death? Sins of ignorance? You didn't, you didn't really, you weren't trying, you weren't rebelling against God in your heart. There was no, there was no, I'm going to do this even though I know God's not wanting me to. It's just like, well, I didn't know any better, Right? And then what about, you know, one time I t- we, were, we were going to buy some chickens, and this happened to Erin. And she, uh, she was about four or five years old. And we walk into this chicken coop, and you know what's on the floor of a chicken coop, right? And so we're walking around looking at these little chickens. And, and um, Andrew and Ann are there, and they're in front of me, and they're older, and they're looking and enjoying it. And Aaron wanders behind me, and I didn't know it. And I bend over to pick up a little chicken, and I hit her, and I sent her flying face first onto the ground. Right? And as soon as I turned around, my heart just went, oof. And the first thing that came out of my mouth as I'm grabbing her and picking her up is, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Would that be a sin not unto death? There was no one. I didn't wake up in the morning and say, let's see. Ha, ha, ha. We're going to go to a chicken coop. I'm going to push her in the... You know, that didn't happen, right? It was a mistake, an honest accident mistake. Would that be a sin not unto death? Absolutely, right? There was no intention in my heart to do that whatsoever. And so I think as we process and we think through these things, some of these things kind of start to make sense. Um, the, the idea of intentional and unintentional sins. I'm sorry, somebody said something? Forgive the sins we've been forgiven for. Yeah, the sins we've been forgiven for. And I still, you know, even though it was an accident, even though it wasn't in my heart, first thing I said was, I am so sorry, <laughs> right? So that we're not saying that we don't ask for forgiveness when these things come to light. In fact, it's going to be automatic. You're going to just do it because it's not in your heart and you, you didn't realize what you were doing. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. And if someone has that, if they would read that. This is what a sin unto death might look like. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. Thank you. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. All right, so what might that sin look like? What are we talking about here? Sinning against the Holy Spirit. How do you sin against the Holy Spirit? You neglect the Spirit. You, you talked about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, right? What about if you deny the existence of the Holy Spirit? You know, we were talking right now, there's a movement to downplay the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, and might that be a subtle, more gentle way of denying the Holy Spirit? Because if the Holy Spirit isn't there, how can he help you? How can he, how can he lead you to repentance? All right, well, I want to bring a little sunshine because uh, Hebrews said it was impossible for those who were in that place to be renewed. Well, go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. A little sunshine in this cloudy topic. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. If someone would read that for us. Matthew 19, verse 26. We're hitting a lot of Bible verses this morning, I know. but Hebrews said that it was impossible to restore them. Dennis, what does Matthew 19, 26 say? A little bit of hope. We're going to find out. Okay. 
But Jesus looked at them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. I would like to make a comment before we go any farther, because Mike's not here, so I'm going to help him out. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> David. Hmm. How many times did he sin? Mm -hmm. And was it willingly that he sinned? Absolutely. Did he grieve the Holy Spirit away? Absolutely. You know, there's so many people today take their Bibles and say, well, look at David. Yeah. He got by with it. Why can't I get by with it? Mm -hmm. But yet, God can still save us. God can still save us. In that verse you just read, he is the God of the impossible. Right. And that's part of our hope right there. He is the God of the impossible. And so thank you for that. You're right. David is example David sinned and fell away but con compare and contrast David and King Saul you know King Saul did things that were not I don't know I could be wrong but in my mind the things that King Saul did were not nearly as bad as the things that King David did <laughs> and yet Saul is rejected Saul is in a place where his sins are are such that He's not finding repentance, but David finds repentance. What's the difference? Yeah, the. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and, and the attitude, you know, when Saul came to, or Samuel came to Saul with the rebuke, what was Saul's response? Yeah, I did the sack. Yeah, but you were late. Right? There's no ownership of... And yet when Nathan the prophet came to David and said, You are the man. What was David's response? Against you, you only have I sinned and done this wickedness. Right? That was the difference. And so we see here, we get a better understanding. Because you're right, there are a lot of people in the Old Testament. And I liked, I, I watched a Sabbath school and... Uh, Fred Dana suggested that part of the verses, Pastor Fred Dana, when you're going through here, part of the verses are speaking in the past, and when it's talking about difficult to renew them is speaking in the present, but that doesn't mean they're going to stay in that mindset, right? They might move out of that mindset because of the God of the impossible and be in a place where they can find repentance later. So we can't give up on people. You're absolutely right. Our prayers... Our desires to see them saved, we can't give up. I mean, think of King Manasseh. How wicked was he? Right? One of the most wicked kings in Israel. Think of Solomon and what Solomon went through. And Solomon had a vision. And Solomon built a temple. And then Solomon apostatized, but then God brought him back at the end. Go ahead. Yeah, in the context of the uh, verse, uh, Matthew nineteen twenty six, Jesus is talking about something that is very difficult. So the disciples said, how, how, can, how can this be how possible? Can it be? Yeah. Jesus is saying in, in Matthew, in verse 20, 21, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Hmm. That's very difficult. Oh, yeah. Sell your house, sell your business, sell whatever yeah. you have, yeah. and give it to the poor, and yeah. follow me, and yeah. then you're going to have treasure in the kingdom. Yeah. So they said, well, who's going to do that? It's impossible. And that's why the verse 26 comes, where well, it's impossible for man. That's right. It's impossible for God. But, you know, you've seen people. We've all seen, I think, people at different times. And we've watched them. And we've thought, we've thought to ourselves, if we're honest, oh, how's that person ever going to be saved? They're so far gone. They, did, they don't even desire anything spiritual. And yet, 10 years later, you come back and they're the pastor. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen that happen? Because we serve the God of the impossible. With man, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And praise the Lord for that. All right, let's move on. Verses 7 to 8. Let's read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. If someone would read that. Back to the book of Hebrews chapter 6, our study for this morning. And... Verses 7 and 8. Someone would read that. Dr. Phil, do you mind reading that for us? 
looked like you got it there. I was hoping I had it. I wasn't sure of that thing. <laughs> Seven and eight. Consider yes. nature. God sends the rain. The earth drinks it in and pr produces crops. But only those who work the soil receive the blessing. If the field is not worked, it will keep on producing thorns and thistles, which are worth nothing. Eventually, people will curse the field and clear it of its weeds by setting it on fire. This is what will happen to those who produce thorns and thistles. Mm. So we got a little warning here. Now, my translation said, is that clear word also? Uh, yes. Yeah, nice translation there. Mine kind of gives the idea that the rain falls on everything, and then some are her herbs that bear fruit, and some are thorns and thistles. And when I read it that way, I thought of, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, right? And he sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. And the blessings of God come out irrespective of whether or not we deserve them, which none of us do, by the way, right? Sometimes we feel like we do. But the truth is, none of us deserve them. And God sends the rain and the sunshine on everyone. How, will, how should an understanding of God sending out blessings on the just and the unjust, how should that affect how we treat other people? Treat other people in our household. Treat other people that we work with. Treat the neighbors that are around us. Should we send our blessings out on the just and the unjust as well? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. All right, let's read on back to Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to read through verses uh, 9 to 12. Yes, verses 9 to 12. Someone read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. Hebrews chapter 6, thank you. <laughs> verses 9 to 12. And we're going to look at the better things of us, the better things of us. Go ahead. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Mm -hmm. So Paul does this a lot through the book of Hebrews. We get the warnings and the, the counsel, and then we get this, what do we call this? What is Paul doing here? One word encouragement right this encouragement and Paul's giving them this word of encouragement you know our words can be so pivotal in the minds and hearts of those around us we sometimes forget the power of words I would remember a lady was talking she was a top neurosurgeon somewhere in the United States and uh, it was on I think it was on focus on the family and they were interviewing her and she was talking about the power of her father's words. And she was in college, and she didn't know what she wanted to do. She didn't know where she wanted to go. And her dad, she happened to be sitting close enough where she was overhearing her dad on the phone talking to a friend. Her dad wasn't even talking to her. And he was talking about how she was in college, and she wasn't figuring out what she wanted to do. And then her dad said, well, you know, She's so smart, she could be a doctor. She could do whatever she wants to do if she set her mind to it because she's so smart. And she remembered, she said, when she was sitting there, that hit her. And she said, oh, I can do whatever I want to do if I set my mind to it? My dad thinks that that's what I am? I guess that's what I am. And that's what she did. <laughs> so you never know the power of your words of encouragement or discouragement will have on those around you. And so here in this word, Paul is giving the, the Christians a word of encouragement after some of the darkness. Now, I want you to notice in verse 9, my, my translation says this. 
But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Things that accompany salvation. What are the things that accompany your salvation? Well, he spells it out. Look at, and he's spelling it out in the positive. This is what's so neat about what Paul's doing here. He's spelling it out not as a command. He's spelling it out as encouragement. So you pick up with verse 10. One of the things, um, uh, just below, for God is, is not unjust to forget your work of labor and of love. So what's one of the things that accompanies when you receive salvation? You start to labor and you start to do works of love. Right, And we keep going on, which you have shown toward his name in that you have manifested to the saints and, and, and do minister. So you manifest this love, you manifest these good works to the saints. Who are the saints? Your brothers and sisters sitting in the church. Are you manifesting love and works of love toward those sitting around you? Interesting. And then he goes on. And we desire each one of you to show the same diligence. So what accompanies salvation? Diligence. To the full assurance of hope unto the end. Going on with verse 12. That you do not become sluggish. So if your Christianity is becoming sluggish, maybe you need to receive the salvation again. So that those things that accompany salvation will come. But... But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So are you surrounding yourself with, to imitate those who have faith and patience? These, these are the things that accompany your salvation. When you receive Jesus and you receive him into your heart, it's not a one and done thing. Now, okay, so I received Jesus, now I can go on living my life the way I've always lived it. There are things that will accompany salvation when you have faith in Jesus. There are things that will come into your heart and into your mind. All right, let's move on to the last section we're going to talk about. We're going to spend more time on this. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 13 to 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. If someone would pick up um, the first four verses and then someone maybe read the rest Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20. As we read through this, someone just make your way to the mic to help read. As we read through these, I want you to pay attention. There are two immutable things. And as we read through this, from the beginning of chapter 6, there are also two impossible things in chapter 6. Two immutable things and two... Um, two impossible things. One of them, possible things we've already said. Go ahead, Dennis. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, surely, surely, blessings I will bless you, and multiply I multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. All right, thank you. So if someone else would make their way to the mic for 17 to 20. So process this. What are we talking about? What is this promise? Where was that promise at? Think about where that promise was at and what the promise is that's being talked about. Go ahead and read verses Uh, to the end of the chapter there. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope to set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Meshelzedek. All right, thank you. So the promise that we're talking about in verse 13, what is that promise? 
Where was that promise made? Let's go back. It's made in a couple places. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. The first place this promise that Paul is talking about is made, it gets repeated because Abraham was just like us. It took him a while to really understand what God meant. So here we go. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. I'll read this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? First time that promise comes to Abraham, he leaves the land of Ur. We jump over. It gets repeated a few times. One notable place is in chapter 15. If you jump over to Genesis 15, Abraham has just, I believe, if I'm correct, I believe, yep, Abraham has just gone and rescued Lot, and he's worrying about retribution for what he's just done. God renews the covenant with him again. The same promise is made to him again with some of the same language. You know, look to the stars. Can you count the stars? Look to the sand. Can you count the sand? You'll be a great nation. Kings will come out of you, right? And this land you will inherit. Some of the same themes keep coming back of this promise, all right? And then he does this weird thing where he cuts these animals in half and he walks down the middle of these split bodies and <laughs> doesn't make sense to us, but in their culture... You, God was saying, because God walks down the middle, not Abraham. And God is saying to Abraham, if I don't keep this covenant with you, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Right? This is how deep the covenant is. And then we go on a little bit further, and we come to chapter 22. And this is where Abraham's faith is confirmed when he takes Isaac up to sacrifice Isaac. And in verse 15 to 18, again, the, the promise is renewed. In you shall all nations be blessed. So what is that promise of? Was this just a promise that Abraham was going to receive land and, and kings were going to come out of him? And was, Is this the extent of the promise? What was really the heart of that promise? Because some of the things that were said in the Old Testament are a little foggy until we get to the New Testament and it's cleared up. It's a promise of Jesus, right? And how do we know that's a sure thing? Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. In verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed, capital S, were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So the promises made to Abraham was the promise of the Messiah. And in the Messiah, all blessings would come. That great nation that he, that he promised, we see again in Revelation chapter 7, the, the multitude standing on, this, on the sea of glass. That's the great multitude that was promised to Abraham. The fulfillment is there. The land, Jesus said, in the Sermon on the Mount, the meek shall inherit the earth. But it's not an earth filled with sin, it's the earth made new. And all of these promises, you and I, according to the New Testament, are heirs in Christ. Because all of those promises are to Jesus. And when we walk in the Lord, when we walk in Christ, Paul talks about being in Christ, now you are a joint heir with Jesus. And all of those promises come to you. So, back to Hebrews chapter 6. The promise that, were, that was made to Abraham, that promise is the promise of the Messiah. So the question as we move down, though, because it said in verse 18 that there are, there are two immutable things. And by the way, these two immutable things are supposed to give you strong consolation. So we've just, we've just kind of seen the first one was the promise. What's the second immutable thing? Any ideas? 
I'll tell you this, all of chapter 7 <laughs> is unpacking the second immutable thing. And by the way, immutable means what? What does it mean to be immutable? If something is immutable, what does that mean? It doesn't change. Hallelujah. The promise that Jesus would come as the Messiah, the promise that he would come as a child and, and be born as a man and then die and carry my sins, that is not changeable. It wasn't changeable in the days of Abraham, and it hadn't happened yet. And it's not changeable now that it has happened. It's immutable. When God says something, it will happen. So that was the first immutable thing. What's the second immutable thing? And see, most of the Christian world doesn't know what the second immutable thing is. I went back to the Sabbath school quarterly from 1943, and it was in there. It was in there, the second immutable thing talked about from here. It, it's a Sabbath school quarterly on the book of Hebrews. Uh, they took two quarters to cover Hebrews. We're doing it in one. So I don't know if we're smarter or we just don't go as deep. I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you decide. All right? So, but back into Hebrews chapter 6. Let me help you find it here. It is the oath. There are two immutable things here. There is a promise and there is an oath. The promise was Jesus coming as a man dying on the cross. That was the promise. Well, what's the oath? Some get confused and they think, well, the oath happened in the time of Abraham. I want you to read something uh, with me. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Just turn the page over and, and read verse 28. This is why I know that that's not the oath. The oath didn't happen to Abraham. Even though Abraham received a promise and an oath, it's not the oath Paul is talking about. Notice Hebrews 7 verse 28. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, there it is, which came after the law. So when was the law given? When was the law given? According to Bible history, when was the law given? Mount Sinai. Where was Abraham at at Mount Sinai? <laughs> he wasn't, right? The oath came after the law, all right? So what oath are we talking about? We're not talking about an oath made to Abraham. We're talking about Psalms 110. Go with me if you have your Bibles to Psalms 110. This is the oath. This is the oath that was given that Paul is referring to that is one of the immutable things in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to read the whole chapter, Psalms 110. It's worth reading. This is a psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of the strength of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn, here we go, and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What's the oath? The oath is is what God did when he set up the high priest. So I want you to know the two immutable things that are being talked about in Hebrews chapter 6 are the two, uh, uh, the two, what's the word I'm looking for? The two positions, not, that's not really the word I'm looking for, the two, the two different ministries, if you will, even though they're really blended as one, of Jesus. One, when he came as a prophet, when he came to this earth, that was part of his ministry. And the whole Christian world stops there, pretty much. But the second immutable thing is the high priest. The next function. Daniel chapter 9, and, and moving through Daniel, the 2300 days, is all about these two immutable things. 
We're, we're stuck on judgment. <laughs> And that's part of it. We, we missed the whole purpose of Daniel. Daniel is talking about when these two immutable things were going to happen, when the Messiah would come as a man, and when the high priest would be established by the oath. And these two things are not changeable. And you have great consolation because you have a high priest that ever lives to make atonement for you. Right? Right? And this is why it was said to Abraham, and you shall all nations be blessed. By the way, the, the, the mediation of Jesus, is it just for the righteous? What happens when Jesus steps out of the most holy place? When he stands up in Daniel chapter 12 and says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust. What happens on this earth? Everything goes completely bananas. Right? The plagues are poured out. Destruction comes. Everything crazy happens at that point because that, that mediatorial work of Jesus, even though it doesn't save the unrighteous, it was still doing something for the unrighteous. It was keeping peace and harmony in the world as much as possible in a sinful world. But when he steps up and steps out of that place, it's not just the righteous that he was mediating for, it was also the unrighteous. And that's why everything goes crazy. The, the plagues are poured out without mercy. We haven't seen that yet. We've never seen a plague poured out upon the earth without mercy because Jesus has always been in the most holy place, as far as we know. And so, so these two immutable things, these two things that cannot change, become the consolation for us. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6. Actually, chapter 7. I want you to see that, that last verse again in chapter 7, verse 28, where we saw that the oath came after the law. For the law appoints, we'll read the rest of the verse, appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Jesus was appointed by that oath as a high priest. And if you back up a little bit more, if you go to uh, Hebrews 7 verse 21, Hebrews 7 verse 21 says, for they have become priests without an oath. He's talking about the Levites. The Levites were not appointed by an oath. They were appointed because they were a Levite. But he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, quoting from Psalm 110. So the oath and the promise. And we hear in Christianity today a lot about the promise and very little about the oath. And you can think of it this way. The promise is your title to heaven or your justification and your oath is your fitness for heaven or your sanctification, if that makes any sense. Malachi says that he sits, Jesus sits as a refiner and a purifier of the sons of Levi. Right? Jesus sits. And all through scripture it says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. All of these are are um, evidences of Jesus as a high priest, then Malachi clears up what he's doing there. He is refining us. That's the work of the high priest, to come into your heart and to refine you. And so, unfortunately, many in the Christian world stop at justification and don't embrace and go on to sanctification, all of which is done by faith, by the way, by faith in the high priest. And Hebrews is bringing us a laser focus on that on that point. So the two immutable things, two immutable things in Hebrews chapter 6, the promise and the oath. What are the two impossible things? We read one earlier for those to come back who had turned away if they knew the taste of the Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. What is the second impossible thing for God to lie? Why is it impossible for God to lie? 
Because he's perfect, that's, that's usually the first answer. That's a good answer. I don't disagree with that. His character, what we're saying, is his character won't let him, right? True. Any other reasons? Any other reasons why it is impossible for God to lie? Because really, if you say his character, you're really saying God can't lie. Like he's, you know, he, he... Scripture says that he spoke, and what happened? It was. He commanded, and it stood fast. The other reason why he can't lie is whatever he says comes to pass. <laughs> right? So if he were standing in this room and he said, look, there's a dinosaur in the corner, and we know dinosaurs are extinct, right? Guess what? Because he spoke it in his word, poof, a dinosaur was just created in the corner of the room. So it is impossible for God to lie, not just because it's against his character, it is against his character, and that is true, but also beyond that, whatever he says comes to pass. And you and I don't have that kind of power, right? If we want to create something, we have to touch it. We have to design it. We have to get tools and, and, and work and put it together. But when God wants to create something, he just speaks the word. Isn't that amazing? The centurion understood this. Do you remember the story of the centurion? And he had his, uh, his servant who was dying. And he came to Jesus. And, he, and he's talking to Jesus. And he says, you know, I've got a servant who's dying. And, and I need you to hear. And Jesus stands up and says, all right, where's your house? I'll go to it. And, and, and the centurion says, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, some, one version says a servant is talking for the centurion. The other one says it's the centurion himself. But the centurion says, no, 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 no. I am a sinful man. It is not for you to come under the roof of my house. I am a man of authority. And if I say to this man, do this, he will do it. And if I say to this man, do that, he will do that. It is enough for me that you speak the word only. And do you remember what Jesus' response was to that? There's a, there's, a, there's a phrase in, in the Bible that has blown me away, and I, and I wished, if there was ever anything written about me, I wished that this would be it. It says right there, and Jesus marveled. Whew. How would you like the God of the universe to marvel at you? Isn't that amazing? And Jesus marveled. And, and then Jesus looked at his disciples and says, I have not found so great a faith anywhere not even in Israel. <laughs> and then he says to the man, according to your faith, right? The reason, the main reason in my mind that God cannot lie is whatever he says comes to pass. And when he says to me, I will give you a new heart. When his word says to me, I will forgive all of your sins. When his word says to me, Speak to this mountain and it will be moved. It's not because of me or my word. It's because of his power and his word. Because we serve the God of the impossible. And because we serve a God who cannot lie. Everything he says comes to pass. There's a scripture in Isaiah that says, So shall my word be that goes out. You know, this, it will not return to me void. It will accomplish the thing that I please. And this is what we're talking about. God's word, God's power in the book of Hebrews. And how his, his the power of his word can, can save and cleanse. I have two statements from, uh, I forgot to read them earlier. I apologize for that. Uh, patriarchs and prophets. And then I, I have a uh, quotation from the great controversy just as we close here. Patriarchs and prophets says, that the new covenant was valid in the days of Abraham is evident from the fact that it was then confirmed both by the promise and the oath of God, the two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, the two immutable things. Then she goes on, this is Great Controversy, page 49, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. So we're not saying one is more than the other. We're saying we need the whole picture. And that whole picture is spelled out, of course, in the sanctuary service. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete. This is what Paul is encouraging us 
to lay hold on this work that is continued in the most holy place. Complete in heaven, we must by faith enter within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clear insight into the mysteries of redemption. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne, and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him by faith may be presented before God. So we get this picture of this whole picture of the two immutable things. By the way, and I, I just reminded of a verse, and we'll close with this verse. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Because these two immutable things have always been there from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is the first promise that was ever given for salvation, right? The gospel message. First preached in Genesis 3 and verse 15. And as we're reading it, I want you to look for and see if you can find the two immutable things. They're in there. See if we can find the two immutable things in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Did you hear the two immutable things? Any ideas? Something that refers to the cross and something that refers to Christ's work in the sanctuary. Did you hear them? Let's start with the cross. That's usually the easiest one. Where do you see in that verse anywhere a picture of the cross? Where it says that, because Jesus is talking to Satan in this verse. Jesus is having a conversation with Satan. Go ahead. In the heel, exactly. That is a prophecy of the cross. Jesus' heel was bruised at the cross. So where do you see anything that might hint to something that happens in the sanctuary? Something that happens while Jesus is a priest. So that happens while Jesus is on earth. He gets bruised in the heel. That happens in his earthly ministry. Is there anything that hints to anything that happens in Jesus' heavenly ministry as a high priest? Almost. And yeah, that's part of it. That's kind of the two together. It's when it says that he shall bruise your head. Do you remember in the sanctuary service, what's the last thing that happens on the Day of Atonement? The sins of the people are placed on the head of the scapegoat. And it's over at that point. So in, even in Genesis 3.15... When it says he'll bruise his heel, and, and I will, some of, the, some of the translations say, crush your head. Even there, you have the two immutable things coming through if you're, if you're looking for them. You have the cross, Jesus' ministry on earth as a man, and then you have, at the very end, crushing the serpent's head, placing the sins on the head of Lucifer. The end, what happens at the very end of his priestly ministry. All right. That, I may have gone a little deeper than you expected this morning. <laughs> but uh, Hebrews is full, as you read it more and more and you will see this, the focus of Hebrews again and again, because of where it is and when it's written, continues to, continues to bring us to the high priest, continues to bring us within the veil to the ministry that's going on right now for each one of us. Jesus Christ is our high priest.